Grant R. Okay. Welcome to session number 19 of Biblical Backgrounds. I'm Dr. John McMath. I'm joined here by my friends in Italy and in the Philippines as we study together the the context, the backdrops, the trivial details uh, that form the, uh, the web of facts uh, behind the biblical stories. Now, the point of looking at the trivial details uh, is to recognize uh, that everything in the Bible uh, happens in a time and place and a part of history. Uh, everything in the Bible fits against a, a web of also true circumstances. And that circumstantial evidence is a part of the argument for the truth of Scripture, among other things. It helps us to see more clearly what's going on in the Bible. So that's why we do it. Uh, today, in session number 19, we're going to begin looking at uh, Herod the Great, and I've got a bunch of slides. I think I've got 29 slides of uh, Herod and uh, Herod's construction. During the time of Christ, Herod and his um, monumental architecture uh, forms the backdrop for many, many things that, uh, that happen. Uh, in the Gospels and uh, later on in the epistles, stuff that happens in uh, Israel and the surrounding countries is often set against a background of something that Herod built. Uh, he's a very, very important character. Uh, and uh, generally, uh, he's a villain, <laughs> not, a, not a nice guy, uh, but he, uh, uh, he was a great builder. Uh, and admittedly, uh, there was a tremendous amount of corruption and other things, but he left behind uh, a huge amount of uh, construction. So we're going to have a look at that. Let me see if I can make my screens come up properly. Yeah, here we go and share. And here it comes. Bingo. Okay, we're going to look at uh, Herod as a builder. We usually think of him as just a tyrant. And he was, <laughs> no question. Herod was a bad guy. Uh, but uh, he was also a very great builder. He was the, uh, the king, Herod the Great, the, uh, the first of the Edomite kings of uh, Israel, actually a client king under uh, the Romans, uh, was the king when Jesus was born, according to Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, and that was uh, shortly before his death. Uh, he was uh, uh, an Edomian or Edomite. Uh, we can say it either way. And uh, he was granted the uh, provisional rule of Galilee by Mark Antony back in 41 B.C., conquered Jerusalem in 37 BC from the Hasmonean rulers and became the permanent ruler of the province. He, he died in 4 BC. This means that Jesus had to have been born prior to 4 BC. People worry about the timing of the birth of Christ. Shouldn't it be zero? Well, yes, it should be. Uh, and uh, that mistake was made a thousand years ago when the calendar was uh, put in place. And the smart thing for us all to do right now is to just say Jesus was born in probably five or six BC, whenever it was, uh, and uh, leave it at that. <laughs> Otherwise, we have to change every other date of everything for the entire history of the entire universe, and that, that doesn't make very good sense. Uh, so he was a bad guy. Uh, he conquered Jerusalem, 37 BC, at least 33 building projects in the region that we can call monumental or can be attributed to Herod. Uh, 
uh, 20 of those in Israel alone, uh, many that uh, we, we speak of uh, are uh, easily visitable today. You can go back and see these things uh, and even see a lot of the details. It's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, he certainly was a, uh, he, he was a politician and in a lot of ways he was trying to keep the masses of the Jewish people happy. Uh, but on another level, uh, he had an architectural genius. Uh, the, a lot of the work that he did or that he arranged to have done uh, shows a great architectural and practical uh, genius of brilliance. Uh, he may have been an evil man, but he was, he was quite an, uh, an architect and apparently quite an engineer as well. Some of the stuff that we look at is uh, just amazing. This thing in the background is called, uh, it's in Jerusalem, called David's Citadel. Uh, and it was never a citadel, and it never belonged to David. But it's one of one of the things that Herod built uh, is a, kind of a palatial uh, stronghold. Not a it was a fortified position uh, near the Joppa Gate, uh, where Herod and later other governors of uh, Jerusalem uh, would hold court. Uh, it's uh, very likely that that's the building where uh, Jesus appeared before Pilate. Very, very likely. Uh, it uh, doesn't make any sense for Jesus to have been taken to the Antonia Fortress. Uh, he would have gone to the uh, to the so-called citadel. Uh, but you can see evidence of Herod's work in the stones. Let me show you the uh, uh, Temple Mount. This is the Western wall of the Temple Mount. Uh, and this is the oldest remaining portion of the uh, uh, retaining wall on the Western side of the Temple Mount. Uh, there's, there's nothing left of the second temple that is Herod's temple, uh, except for the retaining wall. Uh, most of the, all of the buildings on the surface and most of the pavement as well was removed, torn up, destroyed, whatever, uh, by the Romans. Uh, when, the, when the Romans came in, they, uh, <clears throat> they allowed for the uh, destruction of the temple. Titus didn't want the temple destroyed. Uh, but a lot of the soldiers in the 10th Roman Legion were actually local. They were Syrian, uh, and they hated the Jews and uh, wanted to desecrate the temple. And so it was burned, and the gold ran down into the pavement, into the cracks of the pavement. So they tore up pavement to get at the gold, uh, and the entire Temple Mount was, uh, was destroyed. Uh, all around the... Uh, uh, exterior of the temple proper, the, the whole platform contained uh, promenades and structures and uh, areas of uh, uh, for porticos, meetings and whatnot. Uh, all of that was uh, destroyed uh, by the Romans. Uh, later on, the Temple Mount was rebuilt uh, by uh, the medieval Muslims. Uh, the Dome of the Rock was put up there, the Al-Aqsa Mosque was put up there, uh, and the walls were rebuilt, the retaining walls around the outside were rebuilt on Herod's foundations. So when we go up close to the Western Wall, which is quite possible to do, you can see this soldier in the, the left standing there praying at the Western Wall. You can see, you get a sense for just how large the blocks were that Herod built with. Uh, those, a lot of the projects that Herod did were done with these so-called Ashlar blocks, uh, A-S-H-L-A-R, Ashlar. It means great big block. <laughs> uh, one of the, uh, the stones that 
archaeologists have uncovered in, in digging on the uh, western side of the, uh, the Temple Mount is uh, 10 by 10 by 46 feet. It's about 3 by 3 by 15 meters. Uh, it weighs in at 415 tons. That's it's one of the largest stones uh, that we've ever seen. Uh, in comparison, the largest stone in the pyramids at Giza in Egypt weighs perhaps 15 tons. And we can visualize how the Egyptian stones were moved on rollers and ramps and lots of people pulling and pushing. We can visualize that, uh, but the method that Herod used to move these ashlar blocks into position is still unknown. Uh, we, uh, some scholars have suggested that uh, the, the blocks were, were quarried and then carved into a more or less round shape and rolled close to the position uh, and then one side after another uh, was uh, carved square. And then it was rolled and rolled and rolled until it was finally into position. That would take an awful lot of planning. Um, and especially if you're talking 415 tons, it's a huge amount of planning, very difficult to do. Uh, I still have trouble getting my, my head around it. Uh, Herod used a lot of uh, stones like this, kind of flat with a margin around the outside, and then the raised boss, B-O-S-S, -S, uh, is more or less flat. When we find the, the boss very rough, sometimes that's Herod, uh, but more likely it's the earlier Solomonic construction. Solomon uh, also used ashlar blocks. They're normally not as large as Herod's, uh, and they normally don't have the flat boss. They're normally a very rough, rocky boss. So you can tell the difference. Uh, Herod also used a lot of uh, construction with bricks, uh, a thing called opus reticulatum, which is small bricks laid into cement with a diagonal pattern. Uh, and he used an awful lot of concrete. Uh, some have, a, I took an engineer with me one year uh, on uh, trips to Jerusalem. And he said he thought that the ashlar blocks were probably made of concrete. And that had never occurred to me before uh, because they, they look so much like stone. I think they really are stone, but he was trying to convince me. Uh, he was a very convincing fellow. Uh, that this was actually made of concrete. Uh, I haven't seen any studies one way or the other, but it's interesting. Okay, a little more on Herod. Uh, this is uh, Matsada. Uh, and I'll just show a couple of pictures of Matsada. His palace uh, at Matsada in the uh, Dead Sea wilderness uh, is uh, quite the amazing place. Uh, he built the palace hanging from the northern cliff. It's on three separate levels with a monumental stairway going down. Uh, and there are only small bits and pieces left to see. Uh, but it must have been absolutely spectacular. Uh, there are uh, dining areas, there's a kitchen, there's uh, places way up at the top where the servants could store all of the food and wine and whatever they needed. Uh, lots and lots of room for cooking, lots of room for everything. Later on, the, uh, after the death of Herod, uh, the place was abandoned for a while. And in 70 AD, the, uh, the zealots who were rebelling against Rome uh, actually uh, lived on top of Masada, and it took the better part of a year for the Romans to smoke them out. It's a very interesting place. Uh, the uh, Herodian is a place that we've talked about before, this volcano-shaped mountain near Bethlehem, uh, absolutely unique in the world. Nobody's ever done anything quite like it. 
Uh, the citadel that I showed you earlier is this structure. Uh, this is uh, uh, a place with the uh, monumental towers. Uh, I don't believe that the citadel itself was meant primarily as a military position, but it was definitely a defensible position. It had some military purpose. Uh, you can see a lot of walls. It's actually rather complex and rather confusing today. Uh, most of the small bricks that you see up toward the top were laid in place by the Crusaders. The bricks toward the bottom are actually those Ashlar blocks, and that's Herod the Great. Uh, this goes all around, and the Romans did some things, and some of the arches are later, and some of the there's some Byzantine stuff, and there's some Crusader stuff, and there's some Muslim construction. Uh, it, Jerusalem is a very complex place. Uh, the Temple Mount is without a doubt uh, Herod's best known project. Uh, Solomon, of course, built the first temple in uh, 967 BC, according to 2 Chronicles 3. And uh, just north of the Ophel Ridge, where the city of David is located, uh, Solomon built this platform uh, and a temple in the middle of it uh, with, uh, with other buildings around. Now, we don't have a real good plan for Solomon's temple. Artists have tried to reconstruct that. There's much that we don't know. Uh, what we do know gives us a pretty good idea of where it is likely to have been. So we know, of course, that it was on the Temple Mount, uh, but whether it sat uh, right on the location of the uh, Dome of the Rock, that's another question altogether. Um, let's see. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the first temple uh, in 586 BC and with his Babylonian army. And after the 70 year captivity in Babylon, around 525 BC, the temple was rebuilt by Zerubbabel. And that was a poor small imitation of the original temple. Uh, but Zerubbabel did rebuild the platform and he rebuilt the temple uh, and some of the courts surrounding it. Uh, when Herod came to power, he renovated and expanded the Second Temple, making it into a, a wonder of the world sized thing. The, uh, the platform itself was roughly doubled in size under, uh, under Herod. Uh, by the time that Jesus was there, in John 2, 20, for example, construction on the temple had already been underway for 46 years. Uh, so that this is a, a, this is a long lasting thing. Herod had already been dead for a long time uh, and the temple was still being constructed at the time of Christ when Jesus was coming and going uh, on the temple mount, there were workmen there uh, building this thing. Okay. Uh, and I've mentioned before that there's a good argument for uh, the uh, location of uh, Solomon's temple and probably Herod's temple, about 300 feet to the north of the uh, Dome of the Rock. This little uh, cupola is called the Dome of the Tablets. It's a, uh, a place that tradition has it, Muslim tradition of all things, uh, that uh, the Ark of the Covenant sat on the limestone pedestal that is surrounded by this little dome of the tablets. Uh, uh, there's uh, uh, not a huge amount of evidence. It's been very difficult to do anything remotely like archeology span on the Temple Mount. From time to time, uh, the uh, Muslims have done landscaping or other things that open up 
some areas uh, and professionals have been able to go in and make measurements or have been able to do ultrasound. Uh, and so we know the shape of cisterns under the Temple Mount and we know uh, in general the, uh, uh, the length of a cubit from the Temple times just because of this. The Temple cubit uh, is about 43 centimeters as I recall. I could be wrong. I'd, uh, I'd have to go look that up. Uh, but a particular size of cubit uh, is something that we'd, we'd expect to find even divisions of cubits in the lengths that we find in the temple. Uh, and in fact, we do. Uh, we can find a bunch of, bunch of things that actually work. Uh, the uh, uh, dome of the tablets actually sits on a line. If we were to draw a line directly from the Eastern gate, let me show you the Eastern gate. There's the Eastern gate to the other side of the Temple Mount, to the Western wall. There's another gate way down low uh, at the, what was ground level in New Testament times uh, called the priest's gate. And a line drawn directly from the Eastern gate to the priest's gate intersects the Dome of the Tablets, not the uh, Dome of the Rock. Uh, and uh, some of the ancient writers talk about uh, going directly up from the Eastern Gate directly into the temple. And the Western Gate, the priest gate, would be direct access for the priests to the temple. So we'd expect it to be there. Uh, but they're, uh, they continue to argue about that. Anyway, this is the Eastern Gate. The shot is taken from the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and uh, that's outside the Church of All Nations. Uh, this is a uh, uh, remarkable gate in that it is uh, built over uh, the ruins of the original Eastern Gate. The Romans knocked down the wall on this side uh, all the way down to the foundations. Uh, and uh, it, when you're right up close to this wall, which is difficult to do from this side because of the, again, uh, Muslim cemeteries, uh, the Muslims have uh, set up their cemeteries in such a way that it's very difficult for Christians to get close to the wall. Uh, that was deliberate. Uh, but it, on this side, uh, some of the stones way down at the bottom uh, probably belong to Herod. Uh, if we were able to excavate another oh, three, four, five meters down next to the wall, uh, we would probably find some Solomonic work left over. But at any rate, the Eastern Gate was right here uh, and the footings of the Eastern Gate, the foundations of the Eastern Gate uh, still remain dating back to the time of Herod. Herod probably built over the top of the original Eastern Gate from Solomon's time. Uh, it's very likely. You can see that today uh, that gate is not usable. It's all bricked up. Well, how did a thing like that happen? Suleiman the Magnificent during the Turkish era, around 1500 AD, is the Muslim ruler uh, who decided to rebuild the uh, gates and walls of Jerusalem uh, more or less around the ancient old city. Uh, and uh, he did a, a different line in a lot of places, but his line around the Temple Mount follows the ancient pattern. Uh, so <laughs> when he came to the Eastern Gate, he, he found the foundations there and said, well, we've got to have, we've got to have the traditional gate. Uh, but then he read the book of Zechariah, which uh, tells us that when the Messiah returns uh, to end history, uh, he will uh, set foot first of all on uh, the Mount of Olives. Uh, and then we'll proceed directly forward through the Eastern Gate up into the temple, which is ready for him to, uh, uh, to worship in. Uh, 
So we expect during the tribulation period that a temple will be built on the Temple Mount uh, and that uh, probably the Eastern Gate won't be uh, opened, but Jesus will just walk right through it. Uh, it's a it's a funny story in some ways. Uh, here's a uh, a Muslim uh, tyrant uh, who's so brilliant that he thinks he can keep the Messiah out with a pile of bricks. Uh, just you got to love these folks. Uh, you really do. There's another shot at the Dome of the Rock. Uh, the the temple platform was roughly rectangular, about uh, 330 by 500 meters. Uh, and uh, this was about twice the size of Solomon's uh, entire platform. Uh, the pinnacle of the temple uh, is this corner. And most of what you see in this photograph dates to the time of Herod, except for the top two or three meters. In some places, it's more than that. But you can see all the big ashlar blocks. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's all Herod's stuff. Uh, the uh, pinnacle of the temple is the spot where Jesus was tempted by Satan. Uh, and we read the word pinnacle, and we want that to be uh, like a tower or something. Actually, it's just the highest point of the temple enclosure. It's about a ooh, about a 65 meter drop from the uh, the top of that corner to the ground below. Uh, definitely far enough that if you fell off, you'd be hurt. Uh, it's a, a pretty bad thing. Then the Kidron Valley is quite rocky. Uh, so not a good place. And that's where Satan tempted Jesus is to uh, cast yourself down and uh, the Lord will send angels to protect you. Uh, Jesus didn't fall for it. Uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, sometimes uh, called Solomon's Stables, uh, built on the south end of the uh, Temple Mount platform. Uh, this uh, uh, platform supporting the Al-Aqsa Mosque is uh, supported by a pattern of 88 pillars that rest on Herodian uh, masonry well underneath. There's a bunch of really, really large Herodian ashlar blocks uh, uh, far underground. The, uh, the pillars themselves that are underneath uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, are called Solomon stables, though they're, they're not, they weren't constructed by King Solomon. Uh, the pillars were probably destroyed, the original pillars were probably destroyed in 70 AD and were rebuilt in the Middle Ages again by Suleiman. And so he's the Solomon uh, in, uh, in this case. And he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, the present form. The, the area uh, underneath the Al-Aqsa Mosque and in the corner of the, of the platform over the past 20 years have been extensively excavated by the Muslims. Uh, they're trying to build the world's largest underground mosque up here on the Temple Mount. And uh, uh, non-Muslims are simply not allowed anywhere near the work. Uh, gigantic uh, earth-moving uh, machines uh, move in and out of this thing. The, uh, the vibrations are everywhere. Uh, the, uh, uh, at, at one time, uh, the uh, heavy equipment vibration caused a gigantic bulge in the southern wall. Uh, the Jordanians eventually uh, came in to try to to fix that, but they they didn't have the engineering. They didn't have the the right kind of equipment, and uh, they did a they did a poor job, uh, frankly. Uh, one of these days, the southern end of the Temple Mount with the Al-Aqsa Mosque on it uh, may well collapse. 
Uh, I, I, I dearly hope that doesn't happen uh, because there's just too much history here and I, I would hate to lose it. Uh, nevertheless, when that does happen, you can be absolutely certain that the Muslims who have been excavating here for 20 years uh, will blame the Jews who have nothing at all to do with it. Uh, but just wait for that to happen. And it's you know, one of those things. Uh, it would be nice if, uh, if some Western power with uh, the engineering know-how uh, uh, would, would be allowed to go in. Uh, the uh, Muslims will never allow the Jews to touch anything on the Temple Mount. We know that, uh, but it would be nice if they could bring in the British or the French or uh, the Germans or uh, the Americans, somebody that can do the work, but they won't. This is that Southern side. You can see the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque up above. That's the lead dome is under some scaffolding uh, in the uh, modern era. Uh, the uh, the wall is mostly medieval, but the lower parts of it uh, date back to the time of Herod the Great. Uh, during Herod's time and during the time of Christ, this southern wall would have had a set of gates, three big gateways just going in and two slightly smaller gates just coming out. The thought was that when it was time for a big celebration on the on the mount, the crowds coming in would all want to come at once. And so three gates with a ramp stairway leading up onto the Temple Mount. And then afterwards, people would would leave more slowly uh, as they hung around, looked in places, did some tourism, and then would come out. Herod built all of that. It's double and triple. And we call them the Hulda gates. Uh, also on the south side, uh, there is a complex of uh, stairs that we call the teacher's steps. Uh, this comes down from the Hulda gates and uh, encompasses the whole south end of the Temple Mount. There are only portions of this that are accessible today. Uh, and this is one small part of that. These are for the most part, the original steps dating back to the time of Herod the Great. Some of them have been renovated. Uh, so as you're walking along, you'll notice some of these steps are really clean and square with sharp edges. Those are the new ones. Uh, the others that look all beat up and old, those are from the time of Herod the Great. Uh, the marble pillars laying there on the ground, are from the time of Herod the Great. Uh, it is uh, entirely likely uh, that this spot where uh, my wife and uh, uh, her companion are walking was the very place that Jesus sat and taught his disciples. That's uh, yeah, very, very likely. Uh, when we come around to the south side of the whole Temple Mount, walk up onto a little platform, this is a view of the uh, western uh, uh, wall uh, with there in the background, the Dome of the Rock. Dome of the Rock is a really spectacular landmark uh, and the western wall is also. This shot was taken years ago uh, you know, on a January trip uh, with rare snow on the ground in Jerusalem, hardly ever snows. Uh, but when it does, it is spectacular, and it stays spectacular, sometimes for a day or two. Uh, the uh, walkway that you see on the right-hand side of this image uh, is a so-called temporary access uh, to the Temple Mount. Uh, that has, since this picture was taken, that particular stairway has been completely removed, and it's been replaced with yet another temporary stairway so that that southern part of the Temple Mount, a big rubble pile that the stairway goes over, uh, could be moved out of the way uh, and the archaeology examined. And that's been done by Israeli archaeologists and uh, some very, very good work there. Uh, but 
in the process, of course, it made the Muslims angry. Uh, it's very difficult to avoid that. Uh, as we're looking at the Western Wall, uh, recall that uh, this has foundations that were laid by Solomon. It was built on by Herod the Great. And when that was knocked down by the Romans, it was later rebuilt by Solomon the Magnificent. And so the, the top layer is relatively small bricks. And as you find your way down the bigger ashlar blocks, that's Herod. Uh, and uh, we don't see any Solomon on this side of the Temple Mount until we go about 15 meters underground. The Western Wall Plaza is considered a mosque or not a mosque, but a uh, synagogue. Uh, this place is used uh, uh, by the Jews as a place for prayer, place to study. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of their places. In the wall that juts out from the Western wall on the left side of this photograph are two arches. Uh, we call these uh, Wilson's Arch, which is the larger one next to the wall and Warren's Arch, uh, which is not used for anything. Wilson's Arch is the entrance to a long underground passageway we call the Hasmonean Tunnel. It's about half a kilometer long. And, uh, it's possible to go all the way through the Hasmonean Tunnel and come out at the Antonia Fortress. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's a fascinating place all by itself. It's uh, officially a, a synagogue. Uh, so uh, uh, only men can go in. Uh, the ladies aren't allowed on that side. And only the men can go in. And you've got to have your yarmulke on. Uh, and there's a lot of rules. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a great experience to walk in there. Okay. Uh, at the Western Wall, all kinds of stuff happen. Uh, Jews come to the Western Wall. Those who live in Jerusalem will frequently come to the Western Wall every day uh, to study, uh, to pray, or, or just to hang out and argue. Uh, these two characters on the right are having an argument about something. Uh, my Hebrew is not good enough to follow their argument. I could pick out the occasional uh, a bit of uh, a bit of word, but I, I couldn't follow it. But it was fun, uh, so I shot them. Uh, the uh, Tuesday night is a bar mitzvah, uh, and uh, the uh, the fellows in the black hats, like uh, this old character on the right, uh, is a Haredi or ultra ultra orthodox uh, Jew. Uh, the uh, the fellows with the uh, with the long beards, the the felt and silk jackets, and the black hats uh, are actually following uh, the um, protocols of a rabbi in Brooklyn in New York City, uh, and uh, he in turn is uh, following protocols that came from Eastern Europe, uh, as so Polish and Ukrainian Jews emigrated to the new world 100 years ago, uh, and they set up communities in a variety of places, including New York and Chicago. Uh, and in New York, the, the Brooklyn rabbis uh, are among the most conservative. And those coming from New York, American Jews coming to Israel to live, um, are some of the most conservative people you'll ever see. And that, it, that's, uh, that's them. Uh, the, uh, uh, the group in the uh, lower right uh, is uh, having a bar mitzvah. And the close-up is on the, uh, the left side. They say so you can just barely see the boy who's celebrating his bar mitzvah. And all of his friends and relatives are there. Uh, and he's carrying this gigantic scroll of the Torah. Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament, handwritten in Hebrew. And this is his big day. And he will eventually, in the midst of a whole lot of celebrating, a whole lot of fun, a whole lot of dancing and music, uh, he will open up that scroll 
and read aloud from the portion that has been given for him. Uh, yeah, this is his big day. That's uh, the first time that he will read Torah in public. And from now on, when he goes to synagogue, uh, he is treated like one of the men. Uh, and, uh, one of the things that the uh, uh, a Jewish boy will say at uh, Bar Mitzvah is, today I am a man. And he is a man because he can read the Hebrew, he can read from Torah, he can fully participate in worship. It's a pretty neat thing. I, I like it. Uh, I'm not Jewish, but I still like that. Okay, that's another shot of the Western Wall. Uh, give you a look at what, uh, what a crowd at the Western Wall looks like. Uh, and it's uh, pretty neat. Uh, on the right-hand side is a shot inside the Hasmonean Tunnel, which, of course, is a synagogue. The, uh, the tunnel uh, has existed for a long, long time. It dates to uh, Herodian and prior times, as the city was built up over the top of this. The pavement uh, is very, very old. It dates uh, uh, into Old Testament times. Uh, so this is a lot of very old stuff, and the archaeology here is extremely important. <laughs> I wish we could get more uh, into it. Archaeologists have been allowed to continue the, uh, the digging, the opening up, the clearing of the Hasmonean Tunnel along its entire length. Uh, most of that is closed except for organized tours. Uh, tourists can't just walk through. Uh, you can only go with the group uh, because everything is very sensitive. Uh, but it's a fascinating, fascinating place. On the outside, uh, this is that cleared area. There was all the uh, uh, debris and uh, rubble and whatnot around the southwest corner of the Temple Mount. Uh, this uh, thing on the, the photograph on the left shows Robinson's Arch. And uh, you look at that and you think, Robinson's what? His arch. All that's left is the spring of the arch, the stones that form the foundation for a monumental arch uh, that would have carried the first part of a stairway up onto the Temple Mount. Uh, this would actually be a kind of a, a spiraling stairway. It would have come down from the upper level of the Temple Mount onto a platform, taken a right or a uh, left turn, uh, come down another level onto a second platform, and then finally down to the street level. Uh, and it, it would have been an absolutely amazing and beautiful structure, but all we have left is this this bit that's left over. The shot on the right, of course, is Wilson's arch. Gives you an idea of uh, how an arch was structured. We see a lot of these still in Italy. It's uh, the Roman period. Arches are made that way. Uh, this is uh, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is uh, one of the few close-ups that I have of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, this was built in the uh, eighth century, uh, of course, by the Muslims after the Muslim conquest, uh, that is built right in the location of what is supposedly Solomon's portico, but it would have been Herod's reconstruction of Solomon's portico. Uh, and the, the look is very similar. When we go outside, I showed you a close up of the straight joint once before. Uh, and uh, in this shot, you can kind of see the straight joint. I'm going to see if I can make the, uh, let's see here. Oops, no, don't want to do that. How do you do this? Okay, let's see if I can get some pointers. See if I can get a laser pointer here. Ooh, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, the straight joint, let me show you the, the pinnacle of the temple first way over here on the left side. Is that showing? That's not showing, is it? Showing on that one. But I'm not sure that this is going out. The upper left-hand corner 
you can see a long straight line. This is the pinnacle of the temple. On the uh, right hand side, lower right of this photograph, under the H and T of straight, go straight down from there, and you'll notice the raised bosses. Off on the left, that's all Herod's construction. Those bosses are mostly flat, but when you get to here, there's a straight joint. Now, anybody who's done masonry knows that you don't you don't build a wall with a straight joint you interlock your bricks and even if you're building with great big blocks you've got to interlock the bricks otherwise the wall is is weakened there the only time you have a straight joint is when you're adding on to existing construction so this lower right hand triangle of blocks is uh, Solomon's construction. It's very likely this is a Solomon's construction to the right of the straight joint. Okay, up on the uh, top of the Temple Mount again, uh, the location of the Temple Mount has interested scholars for uh, maybe 150 years since uh, people started going and measuring things. Uh, there are two models that are popular. Uh, one puts the uh, uh, put Solomon's temple right on top of the Dome of the Rock, the golden dome there in the background. Uh, uh, another more recent model by Israeli archaeologists uh, puts the temple over the Dome of the Tablets here in the foreground. And the difference is about 100 meters. Uh, and uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, and uh, I, I think... I think it matters. <laughs> the uh, 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 Dome of the Tablets location is supported by uh, Josephus, uh, by some measurements and cistern finds. Uh, but really, there's not an awful lot of uh, argument uh, on the ground. There, there's not a lot of evidence. In the Dome of the Rock itself, there are some indentations in the rock that seem to indicate prior construction. Uh, we really don't know what that is. The hole in the rock uh, is actually a, an early Bronze Age shaft tomb. Uh, it's very unlikely that Solomon would have built the temple on top of an ancient pagan tomb, uh, but he might have. It might have been filled with rubble at the time. So there's a lot we don't know. And uh, uh, most scholars are unwilling to say for sure that either spot is the right spot. <laughs> I think one of them probably is. I think it's probably the Dome of the Tablets, uh, but I'm not a specialist. And uh, that's, that's just a, uh, an informed opinion. Let's have a look at the uh, 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 judgment seat of uh, Pilate, and I've got some pictures here on the left uh, from uh, David's citadel area. The location of the uh, judgment seat that Pilate would have used for the final judgment of Christ uh, is uh, widely disputed. The traditional location is at the north end of the Temple Mount platform called the Antonia Fortress. Uh, the problem with that uh, is that uh, all of the sites associated with that tradition are very late. Uh, things like the uh, 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 the uh, uh, oh, it's escaping me. Uh, but there are there are arches and pavements and uh, uh, stone features in various places along the so-called Via Dolorosa uh, that are actually quite late. They were, they were uh, built during the Byzantine era, uh, four or 500 years after the time of Christ. Uh, so they really can't be uh, the right places. Um, the Antonia Fortress uh, was a 
was a literal fortress. It was a military garrison. Uh, there were places for the soldiers to, to sleep and eat inside, and there were big, strong walls for uh, defending the position. Uh, it was uh, frequently in use to overlook the Temple Mount to make sure that no riots were happening. Uh, there were no interior rooms that could have been conveniently used by Pilate as a judgment seat. The Citadel area, on the other hand, was more of a palatial structure, a good place for, for a king to sit in judgment, in other words. There's plenty of room and lots of nice, big, monumental, impressive places. A lot of modern scholars think it's very likely that uh, Jesus' judgment, his final judgment before Pilate, happened here rather than uh, at, the, uh, at the other place. Uh, but again, I can't show you the exact one. And uh, uh, it's, uh, although it's quite reasonable, uh, we can't say for sure. Outside Jerusalem, I've showed you the Herodian before, and here's a few more pictures. It's just fun to go there. It's such a unique location. Uh, that round thing in the background is a tower. It's just cool. Outside the Herodian, down on the flats, this is an artist's conception on the left of what uh, the um, party palace would have looked like. I, do, I don't know what else to call it. Uh, Herod would get together with uh, three or 4,000 of his best friends uh, and throw parties. Uh, and they, there are the porticos and walkways and reflecting pools and but whatever, uh, and lots of water. Uh, it's just a, it's a very pretty place. Uh, and we see the ruins of that uh, taken with this drone shot on the uh, on the right. Uh, none of none of that was designed for living. <laughs> there are no bedrooms. Uh, there's a gigantic kitchen area, uh, so the servants would have been preparing tons of food uh, for this gigantic, lavish Roman party. Uh, but there's no place to go sleep it off afterwards. I, I, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing. Maybe everybody got in the limousines and went home. But at any rate, it's a, it's a big, uh, big deal. Uh, another shot of Matsada, just to give you some idea. This is the view from upper left is the view from the parking lot looking up at Matsada. You can imagine in 70 AD when, they, uh, when the Romans were looking at this, and thinking, how do, how do you take a thing like this? It's a Corinthian capital on the right, uh, typical of uh, Herod's uh, uh, buildings. Uh, that's me in the lower central. I'm getting ready to walk up the snake path. The upper left uh, photograph, you can see just a small trace uh, that's a, uh, there's a trail that you can follow from the parking lot all the way to a set of stairs that will get you up onto the, uh, the upper platform of Matsada. Uh, it used to be free uh, to walk up there and uh, you didn't have to take the cable car. Uh, today, that's no longer allowed and you're only allowed to take the cable car. Uh, and I don't like that. I, I prefer to. I prefer to walk up because it's cheaper. <laughs> I'm a, I am one cheap guy. This is uh, uh, Caesarea Maritima, uh, uh, Caesarea in Hebrew. Uh, that's a, a Jewish fisherman on the left. Uh, the building in the middle uh, is uh, actually today it's a restaurant built on Crusader ruins that are in turn built on Herod's port. Uh, the two boys on the right are standing on the footings of Herod's artificial port. The city of uh, uh, Caesarea, Caesarea uh, was built from scratch by Herod uh, as uh, an alternative to Joppa uh, or Akko as a port. Uh, and it was uh, a port in the most modern style. It was possible to, to drag 
uh, boats completely up out of the water uh, here. It was a, an amazing thing uh, with uh, very modern features. Uh, Herod also built this with, with a hippodrome, with theaters, with palaces, uh, with a, a large residential area. It's really quite, quite the amazing city. Uh, to provide uh, Caesarea with water, uh, Herod had three aqueducts built uh, coming down from the Carmel Ridge. Uh, one of those is still visible today. Uh, there are remnants of the others, but uh, this one is still up and it's a tourist attraction. Uh, I took a group, uh, a group of men one year I think there were 13 of us, and uh, we uh, got into uh, Israel like at two in the morning, and I had to wait for an hour and a half to get our van, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I wasn't planning on a hotel that day, but we were just dead tired. We, the, uh, uh, the flights had all gotten messed up, uh, and uh, so we drove up the coast as far as Caesarea, about uh, about six in the morning, got to Caesarea, pulled out to the aqueduct. We all pulled our sleeping bags out of our packs, uh, crawled under the uh, the aqueduct and slept for about three hours. Uh, I remember it well. That was, uh, that was fun. Uh, at Caesarea, Herod built a theater, one of the most famous of the Roman theaters in Israel. Uh, the uh, the young man in the upper left, uh, who's uh, just standing on that platform, is in about the place that the Apostle Paul would have stood when he was tried in this place. Uh, most of the stones are the ancient stones. They're still in the same place. Uh, that arch on the right is a classic Roman arch. Uh, when uh, uh, Jesus is described as the head of the corner, that's what he's talking about. Uh, there's a, a keystone in this particular arch. There's a, an interlocking set of four stones that form the keystone all the way up at the top. And all of the weight uh, is held by those stones. Kind of a neat thing. Outside of Jerusalem again, uh, uh, Herod did quite a bit of work at Samaria. Uh, Omri, of course, the uh, northern king, built the, uh, the capital, Samaria. But Herod built a new Hellenistic city that he named Sebast. And we call it still Samaria. Uh, but this is a tower that Herod built. And this on the left is a, uh, a temple uh, in honor of Augustus Caesar. And people who go to Samaria today, uh, which is a difficult place to get to, by the way, uh, uh, will often see these beautiful Roman towers, and they'll assume that that was towers that were built by King Omri. That's not. Uh, all of uh, all of Omri's work is uh, destroyed and, and gone. We can see the footings of Omri's work, uh, but Herod's is still standing. Okay, a lot of other good stuff. There's uh, oh no 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 yeah. Okay, in Hebron, Herod built uh, this monumental. Uh, structure over the uh, cave of the patriarchs. Uh, and uh, this is all Herodian work, except for the top little bit. Off on the left and off on the right, you'll see the minarets that uh, tell us that this place was turned into a mosque. Uh, about uh, 100 years ago, uh, when the Jews began moving back into Israel, a small group of Jews began to live in Hebron uh, and uh, uh, worked out an agreement where the, the building could be used as a synagogue one day a week and a mosque all the rest of the time. Uh, it is, in fact, the right place. 
It's very likely that the Temple Mount looked like this uh, with the, the in and out structure of the stonework around the outside. Uh, so this gives us a rare glimpse of how Herod would likely have built his stuff. All of this Herodian monumental architecture would have been in good shape in uh, biblical times. Uh, when, uh, uh, when Jesus was there and when the New Testament uh, actions were right in the throes of happening, when this was all going on, uh, Herod's construction uh, would have formed the immediate background. And a lot of what we read in the Bible assumes that we know about these things. Uh, so when you hear about some massive thing, there's a real good chance that it was built by Herod the Great. He's the great builder of the New Testament era. Uh, and uh, much, as, uh, uh, much as I despise him as a, uh, as a tyrant and uh, an ungodly ruler, uh, he did some remarkable stuff. Uh, and it's, it's tough to get too angry with him because of that. Okay, uh, that'll be it for today. Uh, we're going to come back on Monday, uh, and I'm going to take you into uh, uh, the period of Jesus' youth and the Galilean ministry. So we're going to walk around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we'll look at Nazareth. We'll look at uh, the Sea of Galilee. We'll look at uh, the, the towns that Jesus went to uh, around the Sea of Galilee. It's amazing how much is still there, uh, how many details we can still pick out. Uh, so that's coming up Monday. Uh, it's been fun. Thank you all, as always. Uh, this is uh, one of those, this is a high point of my week. I always enjoy uh, getting together with you. Uh, and I'm uh, looking forward to a time that we can all get together in Italy, in the Philippines, wherever. You know, it, it, there's a good chance that all of us won't be together again till we all get to heaven. So that's something to look forward to. Bye bye, everybody. Love y'all. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Dr. John. Thank you. Dr. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Take care, Raj. Anthony. Hey, Oscar. Good to see you, my friend. Bye bye, Doc. Yeah, you made it. Thank you very it. much, Dr. John. Brother Joel, hey, how are you? Good to see you, my friend. Okay, bye bye, everybody. Bye bye, guys.